And because of that, you see things that uh, may be disturbing, but uh, over the course of a normal person's career, you'd only see one or two of these instances. Why did we give up on visiting the moon? NASA is still the only space agency that has sent astronauts to walk on the moon out of all the others that are now operating. The second largest budgeted organization, the China National Space Administration, isn't any closer to completing the task either. In July of 1969, humans accomplished a remarkable achievement of engineering, science, and human endeavor when Apollo 11 landed on the moon. It was a moment everyone around the globe had been anticipating. The United States thus became the final nation to successfully land a man on the moon in December 1972, when the Apollo program abruptly ended after Apollo 17. The astronauts returned home after bringing rocks, photographs, experiments, and flags. However, the Apollo program's stays on the moon did not cement a permanent human presence on the moon. Edward Snowden claims that our conceptions of the moon are incorrect. So, why did we leave the moon in the 1970s and never go back? Join us now as we answer the extraordinary questions. Why haven't we gone back to the moon? And why is it not what we think it is? More than half a century after Apollo 17 landed a crew on the moon in December 1972, there are several compelling arguments for a permanent human return to Earth's large, dusty satellite. Unfortunately, it appears that most of the information and expertise that allowed us to reach the moon in the 20th century has been lost. It's hard to believe that NASA wasn't able to save everything from the program after the massive funding cut that occurred in 1972, but that's the reality. The original footage of the moon landing was taped over, and NASA has already been criticized for not saving important materials in the past. Because the moon landing was originally broadcast live on television, we naturally still have access to a wealth of material from that historic event. However, what was lost was a raw, low frame rate feed that couldn't be used for airing. But it's not only the tapes, virtually nothing else that contributed to the Apollo 11 moon landing has survived. We may have plans and blueprints for rockets and lunar modules, but we lack the specialists who built the actual ship that landed humans on our nearest planetary neighbor. Hundreds of thousands of brilliant engineers, designers, and physicists contributed to the program. Without those same people, we can't repeat the successes of the 1960s and send a human to the moon. Since the budget cuts forced the closure of facilities producing specialized parts for space flights, we can't even use the same construction materials. Therefore, we also lack that information. Even though there is a wealth of literature and digital resources dedicated to moon technology that has been available for decades, we have lost the technology we formerly employed due to its immense complexity. While it's important to document as much as possible, there will inevitably be details that weren't captured on paper yet were crucial to the mission's accomplishment, but have since been forgotten. Because of this, we can't just recreate the lunar modules and the Saturn V rocket as they were in 1969 and head back to the moon. Nonetheless, it is interesting to note that some people have tried to recreate that gear, particularly the massive F-1 engine used in the Saturn V rocket. At more than 360 feet in height, it was the tallest and mightiest rocket ever launched. In the 2010s, researchers attempted to revive an F-1 engine that hadn't flown since 1973 in the hopes of rediscovering the technology and incorporating it into the design of future launch vehicles. The young NASA engineers labored feverishly to rebuild the engine from scratch using whatever resources and historical records they could find. Due to its relatively straightforward design, the F-1 engine could help NASA cut costs in the future of space exploration if the technology is rediscovered. Although the Saturn V was one of the world's most well-known launch vehicles and was arguably the most crucial to the development of human spaceflight, this mission was still incredibly challenging to complete. There are other issues that make it not merely undesirable, but impossible to repurpose Apollo hardware. Big, one-time-use rockets aren't sustainable or environmentally friendly in the 21st century, which is why there's been such a recent push for reusable vehicles. SpaceX's Falcon 9 is the industry standard for reusable rockets, although other businesses like Virgin and Blue Origin are developing their own reusable modules and parts. Similarly, 
NASA is trying to find reusable parts for Artemis. Plus, we've done a lot more space research without ever setting foot on the moon, so if we give ourselves enough time, we can do what the Apollo program did, plus more. Artemis's $35 billion price tag is far lower than Apollo's $80 billion estimate. Artemis will use SpaceX hardware and also have the backing of other major space organizations, including the European Space Agency and the Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency. Therefore, a lot of money and time has been put into its development. If we still had access to Apollo's technology today, it wouldn't be useful because we've advanced so much. Although it's disheartening to consider that the equipment and personnel responsible for the Apollo missions no longer exist, the fact remains that no body of knowledge can survive indefinitely. Whether it be through destruction or because it was seen to be too elementary at the time, everything is vulnerable to being forgotten. Another factor explaining why we don't simply revisit the moon is its difficulty. The mission to send humans to the moon and bring them back would be one of the most challenging and audacious scientific endeavors ever attempted, according to Edward Snowden. The political struggle over NASA's purpose and funding is merely one factor keeping humanity from the moon. In addition to being a potential death trap for humans, the moon is 4.5 billion years old. Craters and large stones dot its surface, making landings dangerous. Regolith, commonly known as moon dust, is another concern, as it was formed by meteorite strikes over many years. It has been discovered that the tiny dust coating the moon's surface contains many secrets. Researchers are digging through the lunar dirt for insights into how our solar system was formed and what life might be like on other planets. It is also the most likely location for the first permanent human colony outside of Earth's orbit. Therefore, it is important that we discover methods to both inhabit and construct upon this challenging substrate. So, it looks like we'll be getting our hands filthy. Alternatively, we may need to acquire some regoliths, claimed Edward Snowden. The term regolith, which derives from the Greek words for blanket and rock, was first used by geologist George P. Merrill in 1897 to describe a loose, unconsolidated covering of jumbled rocks and small particles. Although we often refer to it by different names, such as soil, alluvium, volcanic ash, and so on, we have plenty of it here on Earth. But all we have on the Moon is regolith. Additionally, both physically and chemically, the regolith of the Moon is unlike anything we are familiar with on Earth. Tiny dust particles pose a practically invisible hazard to any future lunar colony as NASA and private space companies get ready to return astronauts and equipment to the Moon. Regolith, or ground-up lunar rock, jams drills and other delicate tools, and is so sharp that it tears spacesuits. Dust can also cause sensitive devices to overheat because it absorbs sunlight. Particles of dust are also dangerous to your health. Some Apollo astronauts complained of burning eyes and stuffy noses after returning from moonwalks and removing their dust-covered spacesuits inside the capsule, despite the fact that they were only outdoors for a few days of each trip. Gene Cernan's face is plastered in dust like an extraterrestrial coal miner in photos from the Apollo 17 mission, which focused on geology and included seven-hour journeys in the lunar rover. Cernan's spacesuit suffered damage to the knee from grit, and the radiators that evacuated heat and carbon dioxide from the suits became clogged. According to a report from a NASA workshop on lunar dust in 2020, the dust taken into the capsule by the Apollo 17 crew smelled like gunpowder and gave lunar module pilot Harrison Schmidt hay fever symptoms. In 2018, scientists at Stony Brook University reported that human lung and brain cells were 90% destroyed when exposed to lunar dust. When humanity eventually returns to the moon, respiratory health will be one of its primary concerns. The long-term effects of breathing in these particles are dangerous. At the time, there was considerable worry that some of the spacesuits would have begun to leak at an unacceptable rate if we had been required to do further work on the moon's surface. We've been trying to get better at it. According to Edward Snowden, we have acquired some knowledge about this peculiar substance throughout the years. It has a pungent odor reminiscent of gunpowder and is extremely sharp. A few have even made it back to Earth for us to investigate further. In 2020, the Chinese Space Agency's Chang'e 5 mission successfully brought back to Earth about four pounds of lunar samples. Over 50 years ago, three Soviet robotic Luna probes returned 12 ounces, and six successful NASA Apollo missions brought back 842 pounds, sadly contaminated, 
with the grit of lunar dirt cutting through the original containers and exposing the samples to air and moisture on Earth, permanently altering the samples. Regolith on the Moon formed when volcanoes erupted on its surface many billion years ago. However, unlike on Earth, this granite was never exposed to wind or rain, which mechanically weathers rock into smaller and smaller pieces. Instead, it has been exposed to space weather, which is much more severe than anything that threatens Earth's productive soils. Regolith on the Moon used to be made up of much larger, more substantial rocks. But over billions of years, it has been pulverized by impacts, becoming a fine, sharp-edged powder. Over the centuries, the Moon has been bombarded by massive asteroids and comets, which have blasted out huge craters and scattered debris across the lunar surface, and on very rare occasions to Earth. Those impacts not only shatter rock, but also generate enough heat to create molten pebbles that cool before they reach the surface again, embedding themselves in the regolith as minuscule glass-like beads, which the Apollo astronauts could see as red dust just under the surface. In addition to the rare large impact, the Moon is constantly bombarded by micrometeoroids, which undergo a similar process on a much smaller scale, reducing any substance they strike to fine dust. The Sun is also an important factor. As a result of the lack of an atmosphere, the Moon's surface temperature can fluctuate by hundreds of degrees, initiating and stopping chemical reactions. Cosmic rays, for example, are little charged particles that race toward our solar system at nearly the speed of light. When they attack, they leave a path of changed chemicals and microscopic destruction in the regolith. Industrial and agricultural endeavors on the Moon are complicated and risky due to the regolith's high concentration of metals such as titanium, magnesium, calcium, and iron, yet low levels of silicon and oxygen. There are much more mysteries than answers about the rough, dusty terrain of the Moon. The meager samples we have collected so far, which, to be fair, are the only samples from another world that we have returned to Earth for study, and data from spacecraft and terrestrial observatories are the only sources of information we have. How cosmic rays and solar radiation mix with common molecules to produce unexpected new ones is still a mystery. The hundreds of craters on the Moon are a record of bombardment, but what they reveal about the solar system's infancy is still a mystery. No one knows for sure what caused the Moon to develop in the first place. If scientists can answer these questions, they will have a better understanding of how our solar system was formed. Beyond our solar system, it may also shed light on the mysteries of the cosmos beyond. The Moon is the most accessible location in the solar system where we can examine the features of a world that is fundamentally different from Earth in a controlled environment. Using the Moon's regolith will be essential if humans are ever to settle there. The distance we need to travel is considerable. More than 14 million square miles in size, the Moon is roughly the same size as Russia, Canada, and the United States put together. Engineers and scientists have come up with some ingenious solutions to the enormous challenge of measuring, drilling, and researching so much more of the lunar surface material. One such concept is the Embercore flashlight, which uses the X-rays and gamma rays naturally produced by a future rover's radioactive power source to illuminate the lunar surface revealing valuable information about surface properties that would otherwise be beyond the normal reach of a rover. However, human explorers can never be replaced. In comparison to our current crop of lunar rovers and landers, the next generation will be light years ahead in terms of speed, agility, and adaptability. The harsh realities of lunar dust, however, will be difficult for them to overcome. One reason why the lunar regolith isn't a good substrate for plant growth is because unlike Earth's soil, it doesn't have oxygen and instead has an abundance of heavy metals. Lunar regolith can support plant growth, although the resulting plants aren't exactly robust. Large-scale hydroponics could work, or huge processes could be engineered to make the regolith more oxidized and farmable for future lunar residents. In addition, after billions of years of relentless solar and cosmic assault, lunar dust has been ground to an exceedingly fine powder, similar to talcum. It is extremely damaging to the respiratory system, the skin, the seals, and the machinery, and it manages to get into the slightest of cracks. But if we're going to settle the moon, we'll need to do more than just tolerate the regolith there. We'll need to put it to productive use. The surface of the moon is extremely inhospitable. Thus, any future human population there will need massive habitats to survive. 
every single floor, wall, roof, support beam, and rafter would have to be lifted from the ground, and that's just not possible. Launches into orbit are prohibitively expensive, thus widespread implementation is out of the question for the foreseeable future. We'll need to rely far less on outside suppliers if we're going to construct homes, warehouses, highways, and other features of human civilization. Larry A. Beyer, a geophysicist at the University of Pittsburgh, came up with the idea of using the moon's regolith to make concrete or lunarcrete in 1985. It's just an aggregate, water, and cement, like any other concrete. Regolith, which is abundant on the moon, might serve as the aggregate. Despite its scarcity, water may exist in frozen deposits in polar craters. Calcium sulfate, abundant in lunar rock, would serve as the cement. Apollo sample experiments have shown that the concept is generally feasible, but further investigation has stagnated due to a paucity of samples. In addition, NASA researchers are exploring the possibility of employing a weak electric charge to repel dust particles in a manner similar to static electricity. To combat dust infiltration, they developed an electrostatic device that uses a narrow strip of an alpha particle source such as polonium-210. The device is able to keep the air clean by repelling the smallest dust particles and attracting the larger ones to an electrically charged plate. Although the device's size is flexible, it is designed to protect sensitive parts from dust, such as a bearing housing or a rover's wheel shaft. The astronauts can't have a rover or any machine with moving parts that doesn't have these. It will be tricky to regulate the charge so that it doesn't fry the electronics in the ship or the lunar rover. Researchers at NASA are investigating using a wave of ultrasonic energy, similar to what happens when you turn up the volume on a stereo and the speakers vibrate, to dislodge dust particles that are too large or heavy to be removed with an electric charge. Equipment like solar panels, which need to be kept dust-free in order to capture enough light to power a lunar outpost, could benefit from this type of sonic dust buster. The Exploration Extravehicular Mobility Unit, or XEMU, was presented at a big NASA press conference in Washington, D.C. in 2019 to help keep astronauts' lungs dust-free. Better dust filtering machinery and harder textiles reduced the amount of dust that might build on its surface, and it was also more comfortable and a better fit for women's bodies. A report from the Inspector General's office stated that the space agency's failure to rain down the expense of the new suit would push back any lunar landing until at least 2025. The first clumsy step toward learning how to avoid the harmful qualities of extraterrestrial regolith, while also using it to our advantage, is necessary if we ever want to go to the furthest reaches of the solar system. Plus, we get to use the moon as a playground, which is really cool. Thanks for watching another episode of Voyager. While you're still here, make sure to click the video on your screen for more mind-blowing videos about space.